Hello, hello, hello guys, and welcome back to Joe's Ventures, and today we're going to be doing part 5, 5 already, really, really wonderful, of uh, Jurassic World Evolution 2 Mod Spotlights. We'll take a look at a bunch of different models of that modders have been making, and compare them to their real life fossil counterparts. And today, we've got, I think for the first time, we've got no, like, paleo edits or anything, we've got all new species. Well, they're still replacements, but by the time um, the next DLC comes out, so about on the 9th, they'll be able to make them full species with their own UI and they're not replacements and everything. So that'll be quite awesome. So these will probably be coming in the next few weeks after that. These will be coming as new species. But anyway, we're going to start off with this really cool little pack that Johnny V made. You guys might know Johnny V. He's done some Planet Zoo stuff uh, and he's stuck his teeth into Jurassic World Evolution 2. And he's done like a little pterosaur pack, which is very, very awesome. So we're going to be have a look at these um, pterosaurs. And look, we got perfectly balanced. We got three um, hatch, uh, three aviary animals, three land animals, three water animals. So perfectly balanced as all things should be. But we're going to be starting with a surprise animal. I think you guys will really like this. Uh, we're going to be having a look at a surprise pterosaur. So let's have a look at you. So we've got here a very, very wonderful animal. We've got Ranfarhynchus. So Ranfarhynchus in Latin means beak snout. And it's a genus, as you can see, quite long-tailed, please, uh, not please, it's all, uh, pterosaur. <laughs> I don't know why I got that. From the Jurassic period, so about the late Jurassic, so the Oxfordian. And um, it's kind of less specialized for flying than its relatives, like the shorter-tailed pterosaurs, like Pterodactylus. Uh, but you can see it has this long tail with uh, stiffened with ligaments that it was also ended with like a tail vein there Really really charismatic look a bit more similar to Dimorphodon than uh, Quetzalcoatlus probably the best comparison so um, You can see here. It's also got a very very cool face here It's got a long face and beak very very long face with um, needle like teeth which we know was used to hunt um, things like uh, cephalopods and fish Oh, why are, you, why are you struggling to stay down there? Huh? Oh, I want to have a look at you. Let me look at you. But yet we know they kind of ate things like fish and cephalopods, not only because of their uh, beak shape, but we also know that from preserved remains with gut contents and stuff in the throat that they were eating fish and cephalopods, and also their coprolites as well. So these guys are kind of known from fragmentary fossils from England, Tanz uh, Tanzania, and Germany. I mean, Spain. So a lot of those uh, places most likely had some uh, Remphorhynchus. Very, very likely that they were kind of globetrotters. But the most well-preserved specimens come from the Sumholfen uh, limestone in Germany. So that has the same places, kind of Archaeopteryx and animals like that. And many of them also preserve not only the bones, but impressions of soft tissue, such as the wing membranes that you see here. And um, there's also scattered teeth found around Portugal that could be referable to uh, Remphorhynchus. Yeah, really, really cool animals. Pretty large too. Um, not like super large by pterosaur standards, but the largest known spec uh, specimen is about 1.26 meters or 4 feet 1 meters long. And about 1.8 meters uh, with wingspan, so about 5 feet 9. So about... A uh, little under two meter wingspan, so about as tall, uh, wingspans as wide as a person is tall. It's having a wonderful feed there. I think we'll get rid of the statistics. And that was having a good feed, wonderful. So we know from, uh, there's lots of different species being described, but a lot of them could be growth stages. It's kind of the taxonom taxonomy hasn't really been sorted out. But really, really cool animal. The smallest uh, Referenca specimen we have was about 290 millimeters uh, wingspan and it was even uh really cool is that these guys were precocial that means they were pretty much born ready to go right out the egg or right out the box i like to say so um uh they were able to much fly right around the go and um really really cool that gives us a little bit of uh, evidence into how they grew up their autogeny so that's a really really cool and um that seems to be following other pterosaurs as well and it seems that Ramphorhynchus could fly pretty soon after hat, uh, hatching, which is supported by uh, a few other studies, especially one recent one in 2020, which is pretty awesome. And they occupy different niches or different places in the ecosystem as they matured. 
So we know also from their metabolism that they grew about 130 to 173% faster than alligators. And this has gone to evidence to suggest that they were warm-blooded or endothermic because not only were they growing faster, they needed to have a high metabolism to support powered flight. So it's very likely that um, these guys may have been um, warm-blooded. Uh, but there is potentially some doubt to that, uh, but most the most likely evidence suggests that it's warm-blooded and it could be potentially that uh, Ornithodira, which is the group that includes both pterosaurs and dinosaurs, who had both have had um, warm-bloodedness or endothermic uh, ancestrally. But another really cool thing about um, Ramphorhynchus is that it's often uh, depicted like a um, skimmer, where they'd kind of skim their mouths along the bo of water and grab fish. But most likely these guys would have broken their jaws if they did that. They don't have the anatomy specialized for that. So it seems most likely they would have probably either dived in the water to grab food or kind of just skimmed along the top uh, by s when they swim. They wouldn't be able to just like get the momentum and dive like skimmers uh, or really skim their jaw along the water like skimmers. And um, yeah, it also seems evident from the secular rings or the rings of bone around their eyes that they may have been nocturnal or had um, similar kind of patterns uh, of activity similar to modern seabirds. And it seems there could also be um, niche partitioning, so different uh, pterosaurs would come out at, n at different times of day. So like pterodactylus might be um, diurnal, they come out during the day, and these guys would come out during the night, that's potential. But yeah, as I mentioned, uh, we're pretty interesting. We know we have some specimens. We have a specimen of Rampharynchus with uh, Leptides, which is a type of fish, in its throat. And then I think we have another one with... Um, Potentially a, a squid, I think, stuck in his throat, uh, something like that. But it seems that like when these guys died, uh, they kind of sank to the bottom at an anoxic layer in the water, so there would be no oxygen. So that means there wouldn't be as much uh, things to really try and decompose them, so they would have preserved them much better. So that's really, really cool. Really, really wonderful little animal here. So next, we're going to be moving on to another pterosaur made by Johnny V. All these three were made by Johnny V, and that rhymes all the time. Uh, really, really awesome. So, we're going to be moving on to another, another, another pterosaur. We have got something a little later, but no less awesome. So, this is a Nictinosaurus. So, Nictinosaurus, which means night or bat lizard, so really, really cool name is a Nyctosaur pterosaur from the late Cretaceous and is found in the Nibara formation of Midwestern United States which during the time this guy was alive would have been part of the Western Ontario Seaway which was a really big sea that separated most of America uh, went through the middle of America and they would have had Laramidia on the uh, on the west and the east coast would have been Appalachia so that's pretty interesting but there have been some evidence that uh, remains of these guys been found in Brazil which Potentially means they had a much wider range than just the West Ontario Seaway. And there's other members of the family that lived at the places. So these guys were a mid-sized pterosaur. And they lived along the shores of the um, West Ontario Seaway. And this has been suggested they would have flown similar to modern day albatrosses. Uh, and other soaring birds. Um, which would have been flying very long distances without flapping. That could potentially make them globetrotters. Which is pretty awesome. So the first Nyctosaurus was described in 1876 by Charles uh, Marsh. Or Ornithine Charles Marsh with the holotype found in Kansas. And there's been lots of other specimens found in there from um, the early 2000s. And this guy was a pretty, pretty big uh, middle sized pterosaur, but still a very big flying animal. Um, the skull uh, specimens show that it has this really distinctive crest with this long tall bit and another one coming out. What has been interpreted as a sail, but um, most likely didn't have um, any soft tissue between them, otherwise it'd probably catch in the wind too much. But anyway, it gets to about five, 55 centimeters long, or about 1.8 meters, or 1.8 feet, I mean, uh, tall in some adults. And it suggests that potentially some sexual dimorphism there. And uh, in terms of uh, wing length, I believe that the uh, about two meters long, or yeah, so that would have been kind of that size, very similar in size, a little bit bigger than uh, Rampharynchus, but still a very interesting animal. Um, this guy, as I mentioned, is a Nyctosauridae, so it's related to a couple other later pterosaurs, and it's on its way to things like um, Pteranodon, and going up later and later would have um, going to other groups. So very, very interesting. 
And we know that these guys grew very rapidly, similar to Ravarinkus from baby to adult. And there have been some immature specimens uh, kind of went from the small kind of specimens uh, hatchling to adult size, which is a wingspan of about two meters, uh, in under a year. So they got these guys grew very, very fast. Uh, and also some sub-adult skulls have been found with uh, nearly pristine conditions with lack um, evidence of a head crest. So it's very, very likely that these guys would have uh, grew this as like a very something for sexual selection. So maybe the males would have these big... Uh, um, press to attract females and it seems like these guys may have been up to five or even ten years old by the time of their death so not quite as long lived as the other uh, animals but still really really interesting so yeah as i mentioned their uh, paleoecology they're found in the nabarro formation which was uh when america was divided by the rest western interior seaway and it's a very very diverse uh, place it was a shallow sea it's found with animals such as tylosaurus um hanolosaurus platycarpus tuzotuthus i've already showed off as well so factorness as well um really just all sorts of really really cool animals have been found in this formation because it was a shallow sea which means that probably a lot of it got up um in the water column so there would have been a very productive ocean and plus a little bit cooler uh, so that really helps with the production uh, but yeah really really awesome animal it just sucks that they don't have picnic fibers because all pterosaurs we know had picnic fibers uh, which is pretty cool it's and something ancestral so now we're gonna move on to our last animal here so this is not too different from the one we got here but um very, very interesting. This is the last one done by Johnny V. We have got uh, Tabijara, but it's not Tabijara, it's... Tupendectylus. Very, very wonderful. There we go here. So Tupendectylus, which means two pen finger, which is a reference to the Tupi Thunder God. It's a Tapijarid, so it's a relative of Tapijara. And it's actually, the Tapijara in game looks more like Tupendectylus than the real life Tapijara genus. But anyway, this guy comes from the early Cretaceous of Brazil and is known from two species. I believe there's um, Nevergans and Imperator. So this one is Imperator, which is the uh, larger one with this more distinctive like crest. And the holotype was found in from the early Cretaceous about 112 million years ago and it was initially described as a species of Tepujara but was put in its own genus. And also another species, um, T. navigans, that was described just this year that has a very very different um, crest that's much more straight and uh, gone almost points up. And it's been suggested that it might resemb uh, resemble sexual dimorphic. Uh, but um, we kind of can't really tell yet. There's only the two specimens really, so we can't really decide. Um, so Trupandectylus, as you can see, is this very, very large crest. Uh, very, very charismatic to the animal. And uh, it's quite big too. I believe that it got to about uh, four or five meters long. And it seems like these guys would have lived similar to things like um, as star kids. So they would have been quite terrestrial, not too much flying. And um, they would have been walking around all the time and things like that. And um, this is definitely the largest species of Tupendectylus. Uh, Imperator was much larger than Navigans, and in turn was much larger than um, uh, uh, Tepejara. Still really, really cool regardless. Uh, so, as I mentioned, these guys would have been a terrestrial forager. And it's been suggested that these guys may have potentially eaten a lot of um, plants and maybe its relatives would have been even durophagus which means they would eat hard things so i think uh which that's a really sad thing to me about tepijara i wish they kind of ate um to give more variety to the um pterosaurs that would have been herbivores but i think that's very very interesting really really cool um, but yeah i think this is the last of our pterosaurs i really love this color he gave it you can see it's slightly parrot but probably not the best um still still looks really nice uh like the crest i really think the crest came out wonderfully so yeah did a good job uh, johnny uh, johnny did a good job wonderful so now we're going to be moving on to uh some dinosaurs now so we're going to have a little bit of a couple returning animals uh most of these are probably returned from eventually uh Jurassic World evolution one mods but they've been kind of updated and put in so we've got a really, really cool guy here. This was done by Hyper SGYT. He can't, he always makes it into one of these episodes, it seems. But we've got a really cool animal here. So we've got, uh, I'll just wait and show you. So 
so we've got here, we've got Malagascosaurus, which was a small uh, predatory noosaurid theropod, so a relative, relative to the ceratosaurs. Um, it comes from the late Cretaceous of Madagascar, so about 70 million years ago, and it was discovered by um, Scott D. Sampson and some other, um, uh, Matthew Carino and uh, Catherine A. Foster in 2001. And it's, uh, it's named after the music musician uh, Mark Kofner, I believe I pronounced that name. So it lived in the late uh, Cretaceous of uh, Madagascar about 70 million years ago. Back then, it was its own continent, so that's really, really cool. It's like its own island, so it had all sorts of weird animals. And what really makes uh, Madagascosaurus really, really weird, and its name means vicious lizard so in Malagasy, so that's really, really cool. But what really makes it weird is that it's got this really, really, really like gnarly looking downturned jaw with these really, really big teeth, which has been uh, suggested to be interpreted as a kind of really specialized diet for eating fish or potentially other small slippery prey. Uh, so it's very, very unique to it. It's unlike any other noosaurid. And um, there's other bones that have been found, uh, such as being bipedal, that indicates that it has much longer hind limbs than forelimbs. Um, but it's also quite a big animal, it's estimated to be about two meters long, or six foot three, uh, six foot seven inches. So def definitely on the larger side, not a small animal by any means. A small, probably small for a dinosaur, but uh, everything small for a dinosaur when you have Argentinosaurus. But yeah, really, really interesting animal. Um, yeah, so it lived in, as I mentioned, um, Madagascar. So it lived with animals in the mineral formation, such as Machungasaurus and. Um, uh, Repetosaurus and it would have eaten small prey and there's actually been some uh, research into its growth uh, so it seems that Malagasysaurus grew um, terminately so it, and reached a uh, sexual maturity at a small body size uh, so it's kind of you can see it's weird but it's a lot of theropods grow really fast and sauropods grow really fast but some also grow really slow and some orthopods grow really slow it seems like these guys would have took eight to ten years to grow to their full size which is a large dog or kind of the two meters long uh so that's pretty long for an animal uh especially for um an animal of that size or dinosaur of that size but we have comparisons we know that um Descalosaurus, which was an ornithopod, uh, took about seven years to reach uh, skeletal maturity. But if you compare it to animals such as Tyrannosaurus, that kind of waited until the 18, and they grew, they had a big growth spurt when they turned 18, and they put on like 800 kilograms a year. So it's very, very interesting to see how dinosaur growth patterns. Some grew fast, some grew slow, some even grew slower than crocodilians. So that's also very interesting. But yeah. This guy I do very, very much like, and um, very, very funky. Um, Hyper, you did a great job with this man. I'm really big fan. Really big fan of uh, Malagasysaurus. Uh, so now we're going to be moving on to some uh, herbivores. Everyone likes herbivores. So next we got, uh, it's not a Matabarosaurus, but it's another really cool animal. I've already covered it before. I covered it a while ago in Jurassic World Evolution 1. But it's cool to go over it again. So yeah, we're going to have a look at this guy. So here we've got Mantellosaurus. So Mantellosaurus is a uh, guanodontian dinosaur related to, of course, the guanodon. It was actually uh, lumped into a guanodon until actually quite recently, so it's very, very interesting. Um, it lived during the early Cretaceous of Europe and is known from Belgium, uh, England, Spain, and Germany. And the one type, spe uh, type and only species is Mentalosaurus and Ophelensis. And it seems to be a uh, much lighter uh, build. I think they're getting chased, aren't they? Anyway, they seem to be, uh, have a much lighter build than um, the Guanodon. And um, was found, obviously, as, as lumped as into a, a Guanodon species, has kind of been split off and made its own genus of Mantellosaurus, which is honors the um, uh, and Gideon Mantell, who was the guy that discovered the Guanodon. So it's kind of a good uh, homage to him. Really, really cool uh, animal here. So, um, yeah, as I mentioned, it's 
very very solid history and it's a lightly very light iguanodontian uh, so um lots of estimates have been putting it at about 750 kilograms or about 1650 pounds in weight and its forelimbs were also proportionally smaller and it means they could potentially spend uh, a lot of time on their hind limbs and are bipedal so this is a valid interpretation of how it looks a very very interesting animal and um yeah, it's, it's related to, uh, it's kind of a little bit later than a Igua Iguanodon, so it's not a, it's in Hadrosaur Aurea, so it's a very, very basal member of that, while Iguanodon is part of Hadrosaur Formis, so a little bit of a, just a little bit later in the chain of um, evolution, but still really, really cool animal regardless. I love this reconstruction, and I think it fits well with the Motobarosaurus now that it's bipedal. Uh, really, really awesome car. Big fan of Mentalosaurus. And, it, and it's kind of weird that people thought this was a species of Iguanodon. Uh, looks very, very different, right? Yeah, I'm a big fan. He loves a good Mentelosaurus. Uh, so now we're going to be moving on to our last land dinosaur. We have got... So it's a mammal this time, I'm teasing you. But we've got a very interesting mammal, so... Um, wait, I need to go through um, uh, the Mentelosaurus. The Mentelosaurus was done by... Um, Journal Bro and Game Videos for Life. Yeah, so you guys did a wonderful job with that. And this next one was done by Leaf and Nicholas Lion Rider, which kind of gives it away, but that's okay. We're going to have a look at this wonderful, um, cool mammal that we're showing off. So we have got here the Columbian Mammoth. So if those who don't know, the Columbian Mammoth, known as Mammothus columbi, that's a scientific name, was a species of mammoth that inhabited the Americas and as far north as the northern US and the far south as Costa Rica, lived throughout pretty much most of North America and parts of Central America and uh, throughout the Pleistocene. And it was one of the last lines of mammoths, so uh, went extinct at the end of the Ice Age, about 12,000 years ago, along with a lot of the other large megafauna. And um, also DNA, it's very interesting, this came out like I think just last year or early this year. It seems like um, they are hybrid species, so these guys were descended from a population of uh, steppe mammoths that hybridized with woolly mammoths. And it seems that that hybridization kind of created their own species, the Columbian Mammoth. And then when woolly mammoths managed to get back into the Americas uh, during the Ice Ages, they interbreed and um, hybridized with them. So that just shows how complicated hybridization can make um, taxonomy. But still very, very interesting. Oh, sorry. And um, these guys got pretty big. So they got about four, t four meters at the shoulder, about 13 feet tall and weighed up to 10 tons out of 22,000 pounds and it's considered one of the largest mammoths it's considered the, the kind of the same size as the steppe mammoth uh woolly mammoth's actually pretty small for a mammoth even though it's the size of an african elephant still very very awesome though huge animal so you can see it had these long curved tusks and uh, large molars very similar to modern elephants and um these guys kind of lived in open areas so like parklands uh feeding on sedges, grasses. These guys were mainly um, grazers as opposed to the browsing mastodons, though they did overlap a little bit. Uh, just kind of eat what they can get, really. They did not live in the Arctic regions of Canada, uh, which was uh, habited by woolly mammoths, but these guys live far south, and they did uh, overlap in some parts of their range and interbreed, as I mentioned. So that's also very, very interesting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Canela's a bit too tall. But yeah, their range is mentioned here over this. And um, for a few thousand years prior to their extinction, they colonized, um, they coexisted with peoples in the um, North America, where they potentially hunted them. They even is even um, cave uh, art of uh, Columbia mammoths. That's also really cool. But it seems like all that came to an end when the Clovis culture, and also a bunch of other factors, potentially disease, climate change. All sorts of things could have brought the end, sadly, to the uh, Colombian mammoth, along with all the, the Ice Age megafauna that lived across the world, particularly in the Americas 
and Asia, which is very, very sad. Also Europe. Um, we That's also a very, very complicated debate, as I've mentioned, but I think we can still all appreciate the wonderful uh, woolly mammoth, not woolly mammoth, uh, Colombian mammoth we got here. A really, really interesting animal. Who does not love a good Colombian mammoth? Especially in our dinosaur games, why not? <laughs> really, really awesome. So we're going to be moving on from these guys. We're going to be looking at all our marine animals now. So we've got a couple modern animals. So this one was done by Leaf. Um, it's a modern animal, so I'm giving you that clue. Um, I don't want to go too uh, deep into it, but that's okay. We have got something very, very special. So we have got ourselves here, we have got the green sea turtle. So the green sea turtle known as Sheldonia Midas, which is also known as the green turtle or the Pacific green turtle. It's a species of large sea turtle um, and it's the only species of its genus. And it lives around tropical and subtropical um, seas around the world with two distinct populations living in the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans, but also found in the Indian Oceans. Very, very cool animals. Um, the common name from the green sea turtle usually covers the green fat that is found on its carapace, but not the color of its carapace, which is usually, you can see here, all of the black. Very, very interesting animal, and I love to see the um, scales and stuff. Really, really beautiful looking animal. I love myself a good sea turtle. And it swims properly too, based on the plesiosaur. So, these guys have a very, very interesting shape. Um, you can see it's kind of like a teardrop shape that's flattened. Uh, also ventrally so it's flattened top uh, so it's look it's very very short look at that very very wonderful uh, that really helps it swim around and it's usually light colored though in eastern pacific populations it can be almost black and unlike um, other members of the sea turtle such as the hawksbill which is i believe carnivorous these guys are mostly herbivorous so they'll feed on in lagoons and feed mostly on lots of different species of sea grasses and they actually only bite the tips of these blades of seagrass so they pretty much just mow them down and keep them healthy it's very important uh, for these ecosystems that have uh, green sea turtles they maintain a lot of the um, they stop the kelp forest from getting overgrown and um, choking out um, not kelp forest I mean uh, sea uh, grass and they're very very important to these ecosystems and these guys also migrate long distances to uh, between feeding grounds and hatching areas so many islands uh, worldwide are known as turtle island because they are where green sea turtles will come up to lay their eggs and females will crawl on the beach Ooh, these guys are getting fish uh, these guys will obviously eat sea grasses they're herbivores but anyway the females will crawl on the beach uh, during the uh, night usually and um, lay eggs while digging their nests and hatchlings will emerge and scramble to the water though most of them will be picked off by predators some lucky few will make it into maturity and they can live very very long um, lives potentially up to 90 years or more so very very long lived turtle very very cool but very very sadly they are listed as endangered as long with, along with a lot of other species of um, turtles and tortoises they're probably the most endangered clade uh, vertebrate out there i think um, they are protected as least but they are illegal to collect in a lot of countries but they are still endangered because of many other activities since uh, some countries still do actively um, poach them for their eggs for their shells for their food for their meat as well um also their pollution uh harms them they well, not necessarily green sea turtles but a lot of um leatherbacks will swallow plastic bags because they think they're jellyfish but also you can see there's lots of uh plastics can get stuck in them and also microplastics are a big issue and um also many of them die from being caught in fishing nets and another thing that's also really hurting them is development on beachfronts uh, that they use to nest on. So they basically won't be able to use them to breed and lay their eggs. So basically they kind of lose places to breed. That means no breeding, no um, tortoises. I mean, no turtles. That sucks very, very much, doesn't it? So yeah, very, very wonderful little guy here. So now we're going to move on to another modern animal. This one was also done by Leaf, but also Tripwire. So that might tip you off a little bit. So we have got um, something a big fishy, some everyone's favorite big fishy. Ah, 
And how, how beautiful does this look? This is uh, a port from Maneater, and this is the Great White Shark. Also known as like the White Pointer or the White Shark. Uh, known for, uh, I've covered this guy a few times, but still really, really awesome animals. So these are a species of large mackerel shark that are found in shallow um, coastal waters across pretty much all the oceans of the world. And they are very notable for being like the third largest shark. I think they're only the only sharks that are bigger are um, basking and whale sharks, which are both filter feeders. These are the largest living carnivorous fish. Um, they can get quite huge. The largest female individuals grow up to 6.1 meters or 20 feet long and between 1.9 to 2.2 tons or 4,200 to 5,000 pounds of maturity. However, most are smaller and males generally get to about 3.4 to 4 meters or 11 to 13 feet and females average mention, uh, measure 14.6 to 14.9 um, meters or 15 to 16 feet. Though, according to a recent study in 2014, the lifespan has been estimated uh, to be as long as 70 years or more, so they are a very long-lived animal. So um, that also <laughs> doesn't help in terms of their conservation, but we'll get into that. So they're the longest-lived, one of the longest-lived cartilaginous fish currently known as well. And according to the same study, it takes a male great white 26 years to reach sexual maturity and a female 33 uh, to be ready to produce offspring. So that's another big issue we get into. And they're also quite speedy. Uh, they can swim up to 25 kilometers an hour at 16 miles an hour and sh uh, for short births and dive to 1,200 meters or 3,100 feet. But um, being one of the most biggest apex predators in the ocean, they've uh, not got much to fear from uh, most other animals, except potentially the killer whale on some occasions. And they're the largest known extant migratory fish, and also eat primarily marine mammals. Up to the size of large marine whales, they will scavenge on uh, whale carcasses, but they normally eat like seals, dolphins, that's their main diet, but they'll also eat on fish, seabirds, um, turtles as well, they pretty much just eat what they can get their mouths on but they primarily primarily feed on marine mammals and um, very very sadly they face a lot of challenges the ICN considers them vulnerable and they are very very um, needy because they're top predators uh, they migrate around the world they're very very slow breeders as I mentioned it takes like 30 years or 33 years for a female to be able to produce pups and um, that makes them very, very hard, not only to keep in captivity, but to conserve, because they're basically globetrotters, so you basically have to travel around the world to keep up with the sharks. It's still really, really interesting. And sadly, uh, sharks in general, there's like 5 million sharks killed a year because of shark fin soup. Also, pollution's another big issue. Nets, they get caught in nets, and since they need to constantly swim to keep water flowing through the gills to breathe, they will die. And it's another big issue. Um, it's just there's not a lot going well for the sharks, but luckily there have been some really good conservation work going into these guys, and hopefully they'll preserve them for the future. I'm a big fan of great white sharks. Very, very beautiful animals, and I think this model's just absolutely beautiful as well. So I think they did a great job. So yeah, now we're going to move on to our last animal that was done by Leaf. This one's also done by Leaf. It's an extinct animal this time, but I'm really, really excited to talk about this guy. Who doesn't love a good um, prehistoric animal? But um, I don't really talk about it because I think I like it very much. So here we've got Titanoboa. Very, very interesting. I believe this is the yellow anaconda from Planet Zoo, kind of modified a bit. But I think it gives us a good break from the kind of normal green anaconda look that we get from um, most reconstructions of, of Titanoboa. But anyway, Titanoboa is an extinct genus of very, very large snake. One of the largest, if not the largest, snakes found. And lived uh, in northern Colombia about uh, in the early Paleogene. And the Sierra Formation, Northern Colombia. And I believe the full scientific name is Titanoboa um, cirrhogonensis, which is the largest snake ever discovered. And um, it's found in the Sierra Formation that's dated from 58 to 60 million years ago, so right in the early pl uh, Pliocene, uh, not Pliocene, uh, Paleogene. And it seems like these guys lived through a 10 million year period throughout the Cretaceous Paleogene where the world was extremely warm, which allowed these large uh, reptiles to uh, evolve. 
So it's very, very cool. And the name means Titanic Boa means Titanic Boa. And um, Sarah Jonensis is a reference to the coal mine and the formation it was found in. And these guys have um, obviously only known from a few vertebrae. But um, you can tell a lot about uh, slink vertebrae and you can tell where they are on the body to try and create good size estimates. I wonder if he's going to... No, no, it's going to go... I don't think Tyrannosaurus can go for that. But anyway, um, the, a lot of the estimates for... Largest individual estimates for Titanoboa are about 12.8 meters, uh, potentially even 15 meters, and weigh um, over a ton or 1,135 kilograms or 2,500 pounds. So that's a little over a ton. Very, very huge, huge uh, snake there. Wouldn't want to mess with it. So it was described in 2009, and the fossils of 28 individuals had been found. Uh, and it seems like there were very few paleogene uh, epic, uh, epic vertebrates found in South America. So this guy really teached us a lot about what was living in paleogene South America at the time. And it seems like these guys were living in the first kind of tropical forest right after the uh, Cretaceous Paleogene extinction, where the world was extremely warm and would have lived with lots of large turtles, large crocodiles, lots of really big other other big reptiles that would have been its uh, believed to be its prey. But it seems like actually it may have been dom uh, mainly piscivorous, so mainly eating fish, which is kind of actually similar to. Um, green anacondas they mostly eat fish they don't always want to go for eating the big animals uh, so these guys were potentially even more um, discoverous so that's very very interesting and the size of this guy is also provides clues to the earth's climate since the world would have need to be water warmer to um, be able to support these large um, reptiles and they argued that the tropics uh, would have been like 32 degrees on average or 90 degrees Fahrenheit that's very very interesting it's very nice guy and um, there have been some critiques and some talks about that, um, disagreeing with that. And some uh, there's another studies that have suggested that these guys could have potentially gotten even slightly larger, about 14 meters, uh, which is obviously not the case. So they tried to predict how big um, tropical uh, lizards would be able to get today, but it seems like you get 10 to 14 meters, which none really get to today. So. It's still a little bit of a matter of debate, um, which is most of the things in both paleontology and science in general. But anyway, it seems this guy was also very, very large and was able to produce so much metabolic heat that they found that its ambient temperature was four to six degrees cooler than the current estimates, or the snake would have overheated. So it's potential that they had gigantothermia, so just being so large they would have been able to conserve their own body heat. But anyway. I think this is our last animal for today, but he's really, really wonderful. I'm a big fan of our big boa. So yeah, I think this will be a wonderful place to end the video. So yeah, I um, really, really, really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to get the little bell icon to get notified below anything. So yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe and bye-bye.